Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, Bjork Record Retrospective. Nice save. Yeah, yeah, thank you. (laughs) Where each episode we talk about uh, a new album in the discography of a very notable artist. Of course, we are in the middle of doing Bjork. Last time we did her uh, album Medulla, which yes. is the, the sort of first album, I think, in what most people consider like the, the new kind of like phase of Bjork's career where she's kind of departing from old sounds a little bit more, being a little bit more experimental. She's just kind of, you know, under her own wing. And so this week we're talking about the follow-up to Medulla, we're going to be talking about Volta. And of course, we are joined this week by Connor, uh, who has been with us for past episodes. Finally, we get to talk about Bjork together, and I'm not absent. Uh, it feels like I've been avoiding yeah. you, and I feel bad for that. Oh, it's good. It's all good. Absolutely. So, Volta, uh, Bjork's sixth album, I think. I should know that straight off the bat. Yeah, it is her sixth record officially. It came out in 2007. And What's interesting about this point in Bjork's career, right, is I think with Medulla, and I'd say with Vespertine as well, you had this kind of move away from the what kind of Bjork was initially known for, which was her kind of like really weird sort of take on pop music that incorporated a lot of, you know, bombastic and loud and varied textures. Uh, whereas with Vespertine and Medulla, those are much more kind of insular records. They are kind of more singularly focused aesthetically, and especially in the case of Medulla, they really lean into the kind of avant-garde and you have very little that you know resembles pop on that record it's a very avant-garde very interesting record and i'm glad that we got to give it some shine but i think understandably at this point in her career Bjork didn't tour medulla because those songs as i think i mentioned last time just too difficult if not outright impossible to replicate in a live setting. So Bjork- That must have been an absolute, like just setting up a performance of that not in the studio sounds like it would be positively hellish. Yeah, and so it just didn't happen, I don't think. And Bjork didn't tour it. And so, you know, you can imagine Bjork, this pop artist who kind of was one of the biggest artists of the 90s, getting to a point where- She wanted to kind of just do a complete 180 from that. She wanted an excuse to have a big tour. She wanted an excuse to kind of get back into the limelight, I guess, or to reassert her identity as a pop musician. And so you get a record like Volta, which is very much, I think, one of the strongest 180 degree pivots between two Bjork albums. Maybe the strongest, in fact, because it's so much more maximal in a lot of ways compared to where Medulla is minimal. However, you know, I'll get into why I think maybe that's slightly overstating it. There's an extent to which this album, I think, is dominated in our memories by some of its most kind of bombastic and, and uh, uh, crazy singles. And also, it's an interesting record, right? Because none of, none of us, I don't think, were cognizant of the rollout of this when it happened. We were probably just too young. But in doing some research and, and actually talking to a couple of people who were around at the, the time this came out, there was actually... The, the release of this was kind of interesting because there were a lot of expectations that were set up for what this record was going to be that it kind of didn't really end up fully delivering on. Like Bjork, T, which isn't to say people didn't like the record, but it, just that it didn't end up being exactly what people thought it would be. Um, Bjork had kind of teased that she wanted to make a more vibrant and fun record, uh, that she wanted to kind of, you know, re- kind of rediscover some of the, the the joy and the kind of like maximalism that made her, you know, so beloved and such an icon in the 90s. And so there was this expectation that, okay, Bjork's coming back with a, with a pop album. Bjork is coming back to do another sort of post, except in the 2000s. Uh, through the through the lens of 2000s pop music and this was kind of uh, this assumption or this idea in the public consciousness was kind of bolstered by the fact that uh, before the album came out it was highly publicized that Bjork was working with Timberland to co-produce a number of songs on this record to have a driving role in, in the sound of the record and so there was this speculation because hip, uh, Timberland at the time you know, he, he was he was helping Justin Timberlake to blow up with Future Six Love Sounds. He was, you know, very much in an R and B esque side of pop era, and also, of course, more attuned to hip hop as well. So there was some speculation as to whether Bjork would be making a hip hop record. And even Timberland said in an interview that he kind of viewed his work on Volta as ve- being very kind of hip hop adjacent or at least hip hop esque in his view. So there was a certain setup. Okay, so Bjork is maybe making this kind of pop 
record with maybe hip hop sounds, hybrids sort of stuff. Uh, I can imagine as well, an artist that I thought of a lot while listening to this record this week and, th- and thinking about it was MIA as well. I can't imagine that yeah. uh, Bjork wasn't heavily influenced by what MIA had done on Arula. I mean, this album came out the same year as Carla, her second record, her kind of big breakout album, which featured um, co- contributions from Timberland as well. So it feels like in a, in a very real sense, people were being primed for a record that was going to represent this real kind of stark, strong paradigm shift for Bjork, this real kind of embrace of the cutting edge, the modern, this record that would situate Bjork right in the middle of the pop landscape of the 2000s, just as her big records like Post kind of situated her in the pop landscape of the 90s, you know, while still doing her own idiosyncratic thing. And then we got the record Volta, which kind of wasn't really that at all. It was preceded by the single Earth Intruders, the opening track on this album, probably the most pop sort of uh, conventional in as much as any Bjork record can can be song. Like it's the most kind of clearly obvious single choice on the record. It is one of the most busiest and one of the most kind of uh, vibrant and colorful songs on the record. And Yet the rest of the record kind of isn't really that at all, I would say. There are fleeting moments. You can tell some of the moments where Timberland has had more of an influence, uh, although I will still stress the vast majority of this record was self-produced by Bjork, as a lot of her music is. The Timberland contributions, I think, are really only on three or four songs. So, you know, if you were expecting a full record of Earth Intruders, you were going to be disappointed. It was very much not that at all. But with some distance from it, with some time from it, I think it becomes easier to understand why it is the way it is. And of course, to feel as though it seems obvious in retrospect that the record was going to be the kind of the way it was. There's still a lot of formlessness. There's still a lot of really kind of sonic exploration for Bjork on this record. There's still a lot of deeply personal stuff, but it does represent, I think, Bjork kind of at a little bit of a crossroads in her career as to where to go next. And definitely, I think Bjork would agree with the statement that this is one of her more irreverent records. This is a record that is really more about kind of rediscovering a, discovering a passion for pop music. And so I have some complicated thoughts on this album, but I'm going to save some of my thoughts for a bit later on because my thoughts may be a little bit more representative of some of the consensus about this being a particular uh, misfire for Bjork. But I know that you guys are both fairly positive on this and i think that i imagine that a good deal of our viewers who are coming here probably have some fondness towards this record um so i'd love to hear from you guys what do you think about this record in terms of how it sits in bjork's career up to this point this idea of bjork maybe wanting to to rediscover her pop dominance or her pop interests and and how you feel that this record's kind of reputation compares to your actual experience of listening to it can we just for a moment here, this is something that we don't typically talk about just because we're so focused on the music, but I think that one important thing about Volta and especially like the expectations reception and the reception of it from going like, you know, down the line of things you can't really anticipate and how the internet works now. I think I just gotta take a moment to mention how bad Volta's album art is and how <laughs> like, I, like, can we talk about for a moment how this just did this album no favors? Like it had its reception at the time, which Riley already alluded to. And then I feel like you kind of have the encouragement of several artists like Bjork online that are very like, they're very much like artists in the world of alternative music, but they like sort of get a sort of renaissance because the internet just sort of preserves their career kind of frozen in time forever. So you have these websites like Rate Your Music and stuff that are just like, you know, they have their entire catalog there and you go back and you sort of have this image in your mind based off of the, you know, the the images and what they associate with the memories and feelings that you have. And then you just get this, this garish red MS paint background cover with Bjork, who I, I can't tell if this is supposed to be like her in like a form or like in a, it looks like she's in a suit. It looks like she's in a suit and she's like holding up a sign on a street corner that says like free uh, fucking like car washes over at the, this. It just, it looks so bad. And it's supposed to be like this combination of like 
fruit and like elemental colors and like it's trying to sort of be an emblem for this album's heavy focus on its environmental themes, I think. But also it is just so like, it's just presented so like, here it is. <laughs> and there's like, like that white outline around it. And I just feel like <laughs> this does not help people who want to go back and be like, I'm gonna look at Bjork's career as an artist and I'm gonna look back and see their other stuff. And they see stuff like this. This is not going to encourage them to give an album like this the benefit of the doubt. So I feel like that's kind of important to mention just in how this psychologically kind of works. I think also, I mean, it, there is an alternative cover that was used on uh, foreign international releases of the record that I think is still not great, but certainly much yeah, more. It, it's better, but it's it's fucking ugly. <laughs> yeah, it very much reminds me of like uh, sort of Animal Collective, sort of uh, really sort of psychedelic uh, tribalist kind yeah. of artwork that is very like kind of grotesque. Th- that said, like it looks bad but in many ways I do kind of think it's like an accurate representation of of what's on the album just because I I definitely I'm glad that Connor and I are here to sort of speak to the appeal of this record but I am in like I also have very weird complicated thoughts on Volta and I'm I'm in the worst possible place because that I already went in on record saying that Homogenic is my least favorite release from Bjork, even though I like that record quite a bit, as I, I think my, my score sort of lets you know that. This, on the other hand, is an album I have to go to bat for, despite the fact that it's my second least favorite Bjork album and have many issues with it. But at the same time, there is sort of this core undeniable fascination I have with something like this. I went into it expecting it to be an album that I was not particularly hot on. But after I went and explored a lot of the sort of albums that are in Bjork's back half of her career that aren't received as warmly, I I think it's fair to say that ever since this album, Bjork's critical reception has been a lot more dodgy than it used to be. Like she'll have an album every once in a while, like uh, Volnikira, where a lot of critics will just be like, yeah, this is a real return to form for her. But everything else surrounding it is a little bit more like divisive. And so you kind of expect this to be some sort of challenging turning point in her sound. When in actuality, to me, this is like, your sort of recontextualization of the album's place and what its sort of goals and intents are really um, make a whole lot of sense because on this album, it's Bjerk doing things that she's already done in a different way and in a way that is almost like the production on here feels as though it's trying to evoke several different sounds and eras of her sound before but it's being done by the same person who isn't exactly super experienced in how that sound should work. Like I, there's so many moments on here where it feels like the Matmos production is trying to be evoked, where it's like, where we talk about these like really kind of thin, like insanely compressed rhythmic sections that sound like honestly kind of alien to pop music in general. And you have something like Earth Intruders, the first song on here, which is just, which is just bug fucking nutty, even for Bjork. I, I'm, th- this is the weird part where I have to start talking about what I like about this album and that I think that it's simultaneously like, I do really like it, but I also think that some parts of it kind of suck. <laughs> and, but like, I find a fascination in that. Like there's this weird, like woozy vocal thing that keeps happening on here where it sounds like someone's at a haunted house going, Whoa! And every time it happens on here, it makes me laugh my ass off, but I also really like it. The, the, the sort of tribal percussion on here, again, really fucking compressed. But it's also just like, and Bjork, of course, is just kind of lo- losing her mind in the background. And it's just, it's just kind of fun. Like, I, I think that's the overriding reason why I, why I really like Volta is that from front to back, with probably one exception, It's just an album that feels like the person and people who made it really had a good time making it. And it has this kind of infectious, overwhelming, maximalist energy that feels like undeniably messy. I think every song on here, honestly, is more or less a a mess. Like maybe there's one or two of the more minimal cuts on here that 
aren't as aggressively, but it almost feels like this is what Bjork's equivalent of jam sessions are. Like everything here is so formless. And a lot of the time it leads to, the, I think the biggest weakness on here, other than how just kind of weird these song structures are, is that a lot of these songs are, they are just too fucking long. Like some of the songs on here that are like six to eight minutes, they really don't need to be. But that said, I also don't not enjoy them. Like I'll just be sitting here and just the, the percussion on all of these kind of goes off. I kind of feel the same about uh, Wonderlust, but that's not to say it's sort of devoid of moments that are a little bit more intimate and more plainly beautiful. I think that the Dull Flame of Desire, for example, is a huge album standout. I think the guest vocals here are gorgeous, have insanely good chemistry with Bjork's voice. And I have thoughts overriding on the rest of the album, but it's it's just a very difficult pill to swallow just because I feel like its designation as the weakest Bjork album has sort of overrided any actual analysis of what people think about it and what its goals are and what it sounds like. And this is just sort of the one that everyone's like, eh, it's whatever. I don't really care about that one. And it's like, I don't know, th th this still undeniably has a charm to it that I think is well worth pursuing if you're into her other music. So I'm in a weird place. It's an album that I can say that I enjoy, but I do also have kind of mixed feelings about it in yeah. some aspects. Um, like, for example, like just something that I am not a huge fan on on a song like Wanderlust, which is actually one of my favorite songs on the album. I absolutely love the percussion, especially at the end. Yes. But like I, I find I find the trumpets to be to sound kind of ugly and like plasticky, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like I just just that little detail kind of bothers me on an otherwise great track um and that that kind of that that's that's the thing with this album is that it's almost every track with the exception of maybe just a couple um i really like what she's going for and kind of what the instrumentation and the production's going for but it's there's always like just a couple little things that bother me about some songs like the 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 softer cuts here even actually even on what i would probably consider my favorite track which is the dull flame of desire also helps that i'm a a noni is that how you say a noni i believe noni. So, yeah, yeah. yeah like, like um yeah I, I love her voice she's just fantastic and the chemistry there is and i love the swelling big instrumentation but like again even with this song even if it's my favorite they're still like a little thing that bothers me, which is the fact that the song is nearly eight minutes and it doesn't really, it, it kind of just stays yeah. in one place throughout, but maybe swelling in like, it's building a little bit like subtly, but not enough to like, feel like it's a fully developed song, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But I still love I it. So. so yeah, this album, I agree. It's a total mess and I completely understand why it's, generally regarded as her weakest because it and, and it's like you said it's definitely her weakest artwork but it, it you know in a weird way I think the artwork does kind of make sense for the album because it's just a total it, it's just a mess that is really not going to gel with a lot of people and I definitely understand that so this is this is an album that I can say that I like but I I like quite a bit, but I completely understand if someone were, were to say that they hate it because it's just all over the place. It's so very at odds with itself in a way that like you can kind of pinpoint what previous Bjork albums have been about in a singular sense, like the sort of context around them, what she's feeling, what she's interested in artistically. You can sort of pin it down, even on yeah. uh, Medulo, which I think is a much an album with much greater scope thematically than anything she'd made before that. Whereas here it's like, I feel like the thematic scope is almost the same, but by virtue of the fact that it's, it almost has none. It's that like some, like, I think the most prevailing theme on here is the environmental themes, which is not a new ground that she's broken, but she only kind of selectively dabbled in it before. And that's another aspect of it that I'm kind of conflicted on is that it's very like, in your face it's very obvious it is 
thuddingly unsubtle. Um, not that I expect that from her. Um, I mean, like Earth Intruders, for example, is very much just like in your face with its lyrics about, you know, people in this instance are the Earth Intruders. And I can see how that would grate on some people. I just kind of find it more bombastic and interesting. I, I feel like she's at least channeling it into something cool. And then sometimes lyrically, this just sort of, uh, I don't want to call it pretentious, but then there's there's songs on here, like I think it's Hope, where she, where I don't really know what she's saying. And I don't think she really knows what she's saying either. Like I will defend pretty much any song on here, save for that one, just because it's not musically interesting enough for me to ignore the fact that the lyrics are like, uh, I, <laughs> they're not good. Uh, the, the comparison uh, specifically to the um, uh, pregnant woman and suicide bomber line, which is something that like, she really thought she did something. Well, I don't really think that she did. <laughs> well, look, I that is my least favorite song on the album, and I probably have the same, same similar request. I'll give her credit. Like, it's based on a real story uh, of a suicide mm-hmm. bomber who was mischaracterized as pregnant by the media, and like Burek's and in, like interest in the kind of hypocrisy of how this person was treated and of how this aspect, you know, kind of colored the depiction of them even though it wasn't real but look i still think that despite that it's a really eye-rolling song and it doesn't help that the lyrics are as kind of po-faced as they are when you also have Burek drawing out every single line so that it takes 30 seconds to say like it, it, it just uh. it, it compounds upon itself um but look i want to say with regard to the theme of the record and like back to earth intruders which i think is the most um cutting song lyrically because it's not just about like yeah. you know people as intruders but it's specifically about like various refugee crises that were going on around the time uh and that and across the world essentially and it and again this is a theme that kind of carries over and, and makes the the mia comparison even stronger as well because she wrote a lot about refugee crises as well and the treatment of people well, and who you know the, the bush administration was really really finding its way into the politics of music at the time and this is yeah. certainly no exception and earth intruders is kind of like a, a song from the perspective of uh immigrants essentially who are you know, kind of like playfully, mockingly kind of like characterizing themselves in this kind of exaggerated yeah. way in which they are represented by Western media. And I, I think that this is the, the song on the record that's most successful in terms of concept because the lyrical, the lyrics she writes here, the, the images that she comes up with, the way she kind of just hangs on words like turmoil and carnage while those kind of wailing vocals are going over across. It's very melodramatic, uh, but it's very bureaucratic mm-hmm. at the same time. It's a song that I think I definitely enjoy this song more conceptually than I do in execution. I have some some serious limitations with some of the execution. But look, I uh, I want you guys to dig into the things that like emphasize what you what really works about this record for you because I feel like that that hasn't we haven't really done that enough yet. Like, what is it about this record that is charming that it does kind of hold up in spite of its flaws? Mm, that's tough. Um, why do it's I? Weird why do like, I, I like this? Yeah, right. I mean, I'm kind of sitting here like, I mean, it's easy to say in the moment, but I mean, I guess if anything, it's like there's the fun factor, the fact that the sounds here are really colorful, and that you can't really get like, despite the fact that they're hearkening back to previous eras of Bjork sound, I still think a lot of them can be like largely successful some of the times. Like, I'm I really like how um, Innocence, for example, kind of harkens back to Medulla in a way. It's got that like really abrasive vocal kind of beatboxing thing happening on here, and I just texturally that's something I really like I like how kind of shaggy and rough songs like this are and conversely I think it does at least while there's sort of a lack of cohesion lyrically sonically there is sort of a cohesion of how this album flows from one song to the other which feels a little bit maybe smarter than I think some people give it credit for I think that maybe the moments on it that I like the most despite enjoying how fun it is is actually the moments that are a little bit more stripped back a little bit more minimal because the production while it can work kind of scales itself back and sort of um, 
I think, what's the song on Medjool? Is it Desired Constellations? Yeah, it's kind of like Desired Constellations where it sort of pulls back everything and focuses on one really tight musical idea. It just kind of focuses on that. And it leads me to finding those as like purely beautiful as previous Bjork songs, but in a completely different way. And it's almost like every artist has like with a long career, eventually like one of their albums are just going to unequivocally be divisive and weird just because they happen to make one odd creative like decision in its making or construction. And I always gravitate towards those albums just because I feel like there is something of value to find. And that's the appeal of this album, I feel like, is that you're just sort of searching for reasons as to why you like this particular side of Bjork. What exactly? You kind of get to listen to this and find out what grabs you the most about her discography. And thus, I think, is an interesting sort of text to study from to learn about her other albums, uh, which is why I would argue that despite being on the lesser end, of, you know, the essential end of Bjork's music, I would argue that this still is just because it does feel like it kind of serves as a draft for some things that would come later. I think if I had to say what my overarching problem with this is, is that a lot of the ideas on this album, both sonically and thematically, just done a little bit better in Biophilia, if I'm honest. But even then, Biophilia is a very focused, very tight effort. You do not get the same kind of experience whatsoever on here. And yeah, there's not like a, there's not really a song on here that I think I would say is like perfect or anything, but getting to explore them in a way that feels so divorced from consensus is a little bit interesting, if nothing else. And I think that there's songs on here, like maybe Vertebrae by Vertebrae, for example, is a good example of this. The song that I'm not overwhelmingly, don't have a huge amount of fondness for, but there is something really captivating about that weird swell of horns in the middle that sounds really really fuck ugly and those really heavy industrial percussion hits it just sort of feels like Bjork an already eclectic artist decided to do whatever she wanted and you know maybe about 60 70 percent of it works but it was also just something that no other artist is going to do other than her there's no album that sounds like Volta which I think is maybe a bigger reason for this album's appeal than most people might give it credit for yeah definitely you know again it's it's it weird because and I, I will say i haven't really gotten the chance to dive into the lyrics as always um, um so like a song like hope doesn't bother me at least not right now because i don't i didn't really know the lyrics very well but um but like the way your ignorance man <laughs> yeah there we go um, but with the way that song like instrumentally with kind of the um, almost low key beat with the, I don't know how to say it, but the, it has some really like nice kind of Chinese, like, has some really nice kind Chinese. of like soft um, Timberland drum textures. And there's an, uh, yeah. there's an artist who's playing. I know what you're talking about. There's an artist who's playing an instrument called the Cora on this song, oh, which is okay. an, an Eastern instrument. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but it is uh, Tumani Dayabadi. Uh, I think that it's a, an instrument. Uh, he's from Mali. So it's an African uh, instrument. I think it's a stringed instrument oh. and it gives these okay. really uh, unique textures to that song. He's kind of improvising over the track. Yeah. Okay. And you hear that like in layers in that song and some other songs. And I just really like that specific texture. A lot of these songs for me it's kind of like i really like what they go for and in terms of execution it's not quite there but it's still mostly there if that makes sense you know like a, a what actually used to be my least favorite track um but has kind of turned into not necessarily a favorite of mine but a track that i like a lot more now is <laughs> declare independence which is maybe mm. the most abrasive track that she's ever made just yeah. straight up like electro clash type shit yeah very and much so i i just found myself really enjoying even though i still feel like especially within the back half of this record it just comes out of nowhere i think that's why i didn't appreciate it at first because i was like wait what what's wait what's going on here but i, I really like how propulsive a song like that is and same with earth intruders it has like a mixtape like feel 
almost you know yeah, I, yeah. I, I i say the 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 best through line i can muster here for my affinity for this record is that and this isn't just because um on i think it's innocence that's yeah the that has a moment on it that reminds me heavily of the boombox employment of uh one mr tom waits um on his 90s albums where he gets real fucking weird sometimes mm -hmm. and the album that this I, I swear to god it could have been sampled from here even if it wasn't but just tom waits's voice but uh this feels kind of like bjork's answer to tom waits real gone where he is basically doing everything he did in his career up until that point in the noisiest ugliest weirdest way possible structurally speaking it's an anomaly of a record it contains all of the fundamental fundamental parts of his sound and it's also just really challenging to listen to it's just very focused on it's like an artistic endeavor that feels like an active challenge to your audience to sort of like connect with this because it contains all of the things that you like about them but pushed so far that it threatens to alienate even the like core of your fan base which i mean i obviously just have a lot of respect for that but i do think that this that idea kind of works way more often than it doesn't work on here it, it, there's a bit of a lack of commitment that doesn't quite pull it to the heights of real gone and like the the virtuosic like confidence and songwriting on that album is not here this is way more rickety this is way less in lockstep with the listener i guess but it's still something that at the end of the day is going to be something that makes me return to this over and over again just to be like you know maybe maybe i'll like this even more one day and just sort of appreciate it for 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 what it is later but it's just such a mm -hmm. gnarly I, i'd say this is probably easily bjork's ugliest sounding album which is not like a flaw inherently it's just sort of meant to be kind of ugly and, and weird and maybe that's a byproduct of the fact that you know Timbaland doing this kind of thing sort of had to push him out of his comfort zone but again I guess that just kind of adds to the unique charm of the record because like nobody other than Bjork mid-career would make a record quite like this so yeah and like well specifically about Innocence like I don't know is that like a it's like a Street Fighter sample or something in the beat <laughs> It immediately hits you and you're like, what the fuck am I listening to? But like the more I listen to it, I just really get into it. That's probably one of my favorite tracks, actually. Yeah. So for the record, uh, Timbaland only did drum programming on Earth Intruders and Innocence, but he also contributed oh, okay. he also contributed a beat um to Hope. He's the percussive stuff on that track is, is him, I think. Um but anyway. As for where I stand, so you guys have touched on a lot of uh, the most important aspects of this record, which I'm grateful for. Uh, and so I can kind of just talk through why I think that just about everything on this record is an absolute catastrophe. Uh, I, that's a little bit I of- I can't even disagree with you. You're, you're kind of right. Again, yeah, like that's I, a, don't, a, I don't disagree. That's a little bit of a purposeful this exaggeration is, on my this part. Is where, that, that actually, that's perfect. This is where people get to sort of figure out a little bit about themselves and be like, is an artist almost achieving what they're trying to achieve as valuable to you as something that like, you know, you can value that she got 70% of the way there, but there are also people who are just like, yeah, she got 70% of the way there and she failed. <laughs> so you kind of get to learn which one you are with this record. Yeah. So, so for the record, yeah. I listened to, I've listened to this three times this week. The first time I listened to this album was actually this week. I mean, the first time I listened to it this week was actually the third time I'd ever heard it. Uh, which is mm. only notable because the first time I heard it was about was more than 10 years ago. So that tells you already about like how much this album has kind of stuck with me as I listened to it once when I was very young and going through all of Bjork's records. I revisited it, I think probably when I was like an older teenager or maybe when I was like 19 or 20, maybe just to kind of see how it held up. And then I haven't listened to it again. Now I'm 25. It's a record that I've never liked. Uh, it's a record that I've always found frustratingly completely falling short of any of its goals and from what I could tell. But it's a record that I have, I guess, now in the context of doing the series, more than ever, I wanted to understand it. More than ever, I've kind of wanted to get where Bjork's coming from with it. And more than ever, I've kind of wanted to see the appeal. So I've, I've really tried. And, I, and there are, again, there are songs on this record I like. 
uh, in just about invariably in all the cases of the songs I like, there's things about them that I wish weren't the way they were. <laughs> I agree. I completely agree with that, actually. Agreed. <laughs> I agree with the consensus that Dull Flame of Desire is the best thing here. And then a large part, the, the, the thing, of the, my biggest issue with this record is that it gets in its own way so much so frequently (laughs) and it's like uh you have songs where there's a great idea a really kind of compelling musical idea buried within them songs like earth intruders and wanderlust and then it's just stuff is piled on top of it so much that it kind of gets to be an indistinguishable blob and it gets to sound very garish and here's the thing right is that there's records pop records i love like fringe experimental pop records i love that are very garish very all over the place mia good MIA and I'm going to come back to her as well and I love those records because of how ballistic they are but there's something about the way that Bjork treads the line here that just consistently irks me it's it's I think maybe part of it is the fact that um she kind of doesn't stick to this aesthetic enough like you kind of get it explored a little bit and then it kind of never really returns after a certain point the dull flame of desire, though, is is satisfying because it represents a moment where Bjork kind of strips away all of the unnecessary bells and whistles and lets you kind of lets a song kind of breathe. I think you can actually mm-hmm. kind of and and yet at the same time she does that while still giving you enough musically and vocally for you to feel like the song is memorable and the song exists in a way that she doesn't yeah. in some of the later tracks on this record for me so i think it's a stand oh, and i think getting anoni on the song that's a cheat coach anoni's voice is amazing i've come to be a huge fan of her music and it was an inspired choice to collaborate with her of course they would collaborate again on volney cura and we'll get to that yeah. when we talk about that record but um yeah i think the doll flame of desire stands out as a great song it is still too long but it's not as too long i think as some of the other songs that are shorter which is a real shame to have to say that uh earth intruders for instance should be three minutes it shouldn't be six i don't yeah i don't know what that was i don't Mm. care for the foghorn shit at the end of this song and it also comes back again at the end of hope as well it's like i guess ships communicating and i guess maybe it ties into the theme of like immigration and like traveling across seas and, and you have i don't know what it is it's 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 a really garish tonality and she tries to like find a rhythm in it in earth intruders at the end and it just doesn't work for me at all wanderlust i mean that said uh earth intruders i do like overall like i think the, the concept of the song the lyrics are the sharpest on the record and the core of it i think is some of the best stuff musically even if it is kind of piled with shit and produced in a way that i find very grating that said, it's not remotely as offensive as the way that Wanderlust is produced and sound and just kind of put together. This song is a fucking mess. I think it's the most absolutely yeah. kind of missed opportunity on the record in terms of like the seeds of a, of a good and compelling piece of music here completely just smeared. Like, so you have these... First of all, you have this beat that is very homogenic-esque and that kind of crushed up IDM-esque sort of sound that's all over homogenic and is on this track too. I'm a sucker for that, right? I love that texture. It's just, it hits a spot in my brain that it, that just mm-hmm. I absolutely adore. And I mean, it sounds as good as it does here on any of the, on the, any of the songs on that record, but it's completely, it, it's completely in its own universe compared to everything else that's happening in the song. Bjork's vocals uh and one of the things that I think characterizes the kind of coldness to a lot of Bjork's later music that you see in in some of the general reception is that Bjork will as her records go on and she does this to greater or lesser effect on the next couple of records too she will kind of sing in this very expansive and kind of drawn out way and she'll do that over instrumentals that are quite kind of static or quite kind of considerably less invigorated than what it is that she's doing. And that, I think, uh, disconnect can be a lot of what holds people back from records like Biophilia and even records like Volney Cura to a certain extent. Like it limits my, att- my ability to get fully in love with that record. And so that's a problem here too, but... It's a problem in a different way on a track like Wanderlust when you just have 
when you do have complimentary textures to Beric's voice in the form of those horns, but they're just so like mon- monotonous and like continually kind of just kind of bearing down and doing this kind of frilly thing where they kind of like do a trill and sort of glissando thing and kind of fall apart at the end of each bar. And it's so like, it's a single musical idea that's not fleshed out in any way and doesn't really cohere to an interesting song. And so that's, I think, what Wanderlust is, is it's like a fragment of an interesting musical idea that just iterates endlessly for six Beard, minutes. Sit down, stand up. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, I mean, I, I don't love that song and for similar reasons. Um, but Yeah, that's what mm-hmm. your, your like feelings towards it sound made that like evoked in me. Honestly, this, this album has a lot of the same benefits and detracting elements that hail to the thief does except i would argue to a much greater degree and the other reason why i can't get on board with it as well is that in vast contrast to something like earth intruders the subject matter and lyricism here is so like going back to the well for Bjork. i mean she's described it as a kind of thematic sequel to hyper ballad this song about kind of being listless and lost and kind of like this this, this inability to stay still and stuff and sure it's true to her it's personal but it's the kind of song that she's written a million times before it feels so like standard for Bjork. it feels quite stock and it feels particularly kind of uh almost almost insulting as a listener to like be listening to a song in this career where Bjork is kind of yet again imparting upon you how much of a restless wanderer she is creative creatively it's like I know that <laughs> like I know what you're like and it's just a really kind of root one song for her I think Innocence is better uh, because it's one of the most rhythmically interesting songs on this record and it kind of has some again very garish textures but the way they combine is a little more like interesting to me and I enjoy it a little bit more yeah. Even if it sounds like, yeah, quite ugly, as you say. And then the record really kind of just stops being a thing for me for a while. Um, (laughs) So one of the things that's always kind of been in my prevailing memory of this record over the many years that I've not listened to it uh, is that like I can remember basically the first four songs and I can't and I can remember Declare Independence, which I'll get to later but I cannot remember anything else on this album. And I was hoping that like just coming back to it and really sitting with it, I'd get to enjoy some of the subtle pleasures of the midsection of this record or whatever. But no, to me, it's just musically barren. Like, I'm sorry, I don't get anything. One exception is I'll say that I find uh, pneumonia to be kind of like genuinely quite beautiful at, at points, even if it really upstays its welcome. Uh, part of that is due to the fact that it's um, the the compositions are arranged, I think, and conducted by Nico Muley on that song, who's a great composer and sort of like a great collaborator for a lot of musicians. He was involved heavily in that uh, Sufjan Stevens Planetarium record that I know you love, Jake. Uh, he's great at um, those sorts of uh, arrangements and that sort of thing. So it's a it's a nice enough sounding song. I do think it goes, it doesn't do enough and develop enough musically for me, but it's one of the more pleasant moments on the record. However, songs like I See Who You Are, just it's another song about how much Bjork loves her kid. And like I get it, the new the new maternal era for Bjork is very moving and stuff, but these kinds of songs are much more evocative. Well, these kinds of songs about not necessarily her children, but like the, the domestic bliss for Bjork were much more evocative on records like Vespertine and even Medulla to a certain extent. Um, it just feels, again, like going back to the well here and it comes up dry. It's, it's not a song that stands out to me at all. Certainly a song that feels like it's trying to find its own identity in real time. Like, I love how like gentle and pretty it is, but like that song just stumbles over instrumental idea after instrumental idea and it never like erupts but i also kind of like that i don't know man <laughs> no I, and that's fear like well, i don't want you to listen to my opinions and then feel like you have to kind of go no. back on the on the things you enjoy um, no, 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 because there's definitely a case to be made and i'm sure there's probably some people out there watching this who have some more positive takes as well uh vertebrae by vertebrae is a real low light for me um this is a song where she reuses brass samples from a soundtrack that she did in the interim between this record and the last one called Drawing Restraint 9. That was mentioned by 
a, com- a regular commenter of ours, shout out storage hater, who's always there on the comments of our Bjork videos yeah, to yeah. give me all the kind of external information. And this person mentioned Drawing Restraint 9 as well as a kind of like interesting curio. I went on to the Rate Your Music page and it generally has a very low rating regarded as a real misstep for her. I checked it out. I didn't find it to be catastrophic, but it didn't really do much for me. But anyway, she takes brass samples from this project and I mean, to me, to be honest with you, this is just like such a nothing song to me. Like it just doesn't, I, I, I've i already forgotten it. And I've listened to this album three times in the last two days. It's just, it, 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 I remember it has, it has a texture that I, the brass textures are just so again, monotonous and completely uninspiring. It just completely circles itself for five minutes. And this is the thing again, as you've mentioned, these songs are so much longer than they need to be. Like there's not a single really song are. on this record that's shorter than four minutes. And most of them are longer than five. And it's just, compl- it's just, it, it, it stagnates for so long. Like pneumonia, I would like a lot more again, if it was considerably shorter. Hope we've already talked about. I've kind of already spoken my piece on this. I think it's the most misguided thing. And I, I don't want to say that, the message that Bjork's kind of putting across here and the kind of reference to the story that she's telling here isn't, you know, emotionally true in some way, but it just doesn't come across very well. And Bjork sounds very preachy and very sort of like, she has the ability to communicate these sorts of nuanced, you know, ideas about real kind of human suffering, I think in ways that are more powerful than what she does here. It feels very, land and just kind of uninspired (laughs) frankly that line where she's just like what would be the bigger shame and it's like i don't know Bjork. maybe the bigger shame where people die like that's probably it if i had to guess yeah why are you asking me this the the lesson of uh lesser of two evils the phrases she used and it's just like and there's like the thing about this song as well there's one melodic idea which is the here's my version of it Eternal oh, world. I don't care for that shit at all. That's the only melodic idea in the entire song. And it's not even, it's a fragment of an idea. And it doesn't yeah, go anywhere. Um, yeah, so yeah, totally. that's that's a that's that song is 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 not good. Uh, I'm gonna skip the no. clear independence for a second, just talk about my juvenile, which again is one of the most unremarkable songs on this record. It just completely you have a noni returning for this, and I again the way they kind of play off each other, the kind of duet um sure yep good fine uh it's another song about her child like i see who you are is about her daughter and this is about her relationship with her son and it just there's okay you have you you love your son <laughs> cool <laughs> Hello, like bye uh, I don't know. You know. I don't know if the whatever you guys listen to this like on whatever platform but on spotify the song is is called uh my juvenile featuring Anoni as the conscience. Yeah, yeah, I was, it's I was, on I was, Apple. Well. I was gonna bring that up too. Oh. Like, so this is this is um, I guess Bjork's conscience telling her not to feel bad for letting her son have independence. I guess um, I don't know. It's it's so strange. But anyway, speaking of independence. I'll circle back to Declare Independence, which is an interesting song. I think one of the most memorable and one of the most talked about songs on this record. Actually quite a controversial song for Bjork because she's performed Mm -hmm. the song um, in a number of places where there is kind of great political unrest because of oppressed peoples. I think she's performed this song in Palestine. She's performed this song in um, Chinese occupied Tibet. She's performed this song in Kosovo. And in all of these instances, she has kind of used it as a way to kind of like inspire, you know, the, the Palestinians, the Kosovians, the Tibet, the Tibetan people to kind of rise up and declare independence. It's a very blunt song. And I, I, I actually am a big fan of the bluntness because it's just the whole point is that bluntness. It's not a song that yeah. would benefit from being dressed up in any way. And again, it's so MIA, but what's interesting about it is that it's actually the, the MIA stuff. It's most reminiscent of is stuff that MIA would go on to do after this record was existed. So the thing that reminds me the most of is uh, MIA's very infamous 2010 album, uh, Maya, which I've always wanted yeah. to do a record club on and I should, get around to doing that someday because that's a record i i love a lot but it is a record that is incredibly ugly 
And there's a song on that record, a particularly controversial song on that record too, called Born Free, uh, that is that feels in retrospect like very much MIA doing her version of Declare Independence. I like MIA's version a little bit more because it's kind of a little bit more fucked somehow. Mm -hmm. And I think that this version of uh, Bjork's song has a kind of real urgency to it that starts to feel a little bit rote in the last minute of it. And I don't particularly care for the drums that are used. And again, it's not that they don't sound good. The point is not to sound good. It's just that they don't quite fit the way that they, the, the, the kind of symbol writing that shit that happens at the end of the song, I don't really care for. I will say though, uh, and I'll, I'll bring this up before our, our lovely friend storage heater gets a chance to do it themselves. Uh, there is a, a, a kind of accompanying live slash remix album associated with this called Voltaic yeah. that came out a couple of years later. Now I haven't listened to the remixes, so I'm sure storage heater can inform me of their quality. But I did listen to the, the live versions, which are actually live in studio, so not live in concert. And um, mm-hmm. it's also it's a mixture of songs from her last several records. But there is a number of songs from Volta that are performed on in this live studio session. And I do think that this context improves them somewhat. Songs like Wonderlust are slightly improved, I think, by having slightly less suffocating production. But it's really Declare Independence that I think sounds the best in this format because it just has a little bit more heft to it, especially towards the end. I love the way that Bjork really just goes for it. And just by the end of the song, she's just absolutely kind of screaming. And and it's, again, this is emblematic of a lot of this record where there's kind of no melody or no melodic idea beyond this sort of first stretch of this record. And it's kind of just really rote, really root one, really kind of blunt, monotonous music. And this is where it works because it feels as though it's spiriting, it's it's channeling a kind of punk spirit to that monotony that feels very like true to the kind of song this is and the kind of musical tradition it's channeling, like the kind of one chord punk song from the 70s that has a really blunt political message that's all about kind of bashing you over the head. And that's what MIA channels to a certain extent on Maya as well. So yeah, that is a big part of why this song actually works for me. And I think that it is one of the standouts of the record because it feels like the monotony that Bjork has been using song after song here actually has a purpose. Um, and yeah. and when she's screaming, you know, um, make your own flag, make your own currency, make your own stamp, protect your language. It's, 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 it's powerful stuff. Like it's, it's very blunt, um, but it works. And so that's the kind of moment where I'm like, Yeah, I think the environmental theme of the record, you're right. I think that's kind of something that she kind of touches on a little bit more powerfully uh, into environmental stuff. She touches on a little bit more interestingly with biophilia, but the kind of political aspect of this record, I think is is maybe its strongest. And I just wish it were more cohesive and coherent and and focused on that idea um, throughout the record, because the moments where it is political tend to be more often than not quite powerful but there's so much of it where it's just kind of I'm Bjork and I have a family and I'm trying to be a pop star and I'm trying to reconcile this domestic life I have with these kind of like huge emotions of my youth that I still feel. And it's super stagnant, I think, as a result of being stuck between those two aspects of who Bjork is. And that's why uh, Volta doesn't work for me. That, that's, I think, a key observation here is that I would say this is the first album that creatively speaking, is a sidestep rather than a progression for Bjork. Like each album felt like it embraced its own identity, its own sound, a new kind of vitality that made it feel essential. Whereas this one feels like, you know, she's definitely testing the water and doing a couple things differently and new, but never enough to make it feel as though it's significant. If if anything, I really want to try out the live album version of this, because if I can find what of value I do in here, maybe I will like that even more. The the, the versions are, again, it's live in studio. They're very similar to the album. They're just a slightly like a more breathing room, I think, in some of the mixes, which I appreciate. That could help. Um, But yeah, I was just thinking as well, like Bjork hasn't really tried, I think, to make a pop record since this again. So I wouldn't be surprised if her next record does try and do sort of what this does, except a little bit more successfully and hopefully a little bit more currently in terms of how it sounds. Mm -hmm. But it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Um, But yeah, maybe 
Bjork returning to the world of pop, if she does choose to do that again, may give some like additional context or make this record sound different in retrospect. But I think the fact that Bjork made this kind of half-hearted attempt at a pop pit. Well, okay, she didn't describe it as a pop record. She described it as trying to make a more fun record. But in collaborating with these kind of like pop figures like Timberland and then kind of veering away from that into the world of, of more avant-garde music again, I wonder if the, the real anomaly that this record is also kind of hurts it in some ways as well. Um, and I'm curious to see how it aged. It recently, it turned 15 this month, actually. So, you know, oh, people have been thinking yeah. about it a little bit more recently. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that people's feelings on records by Bjork do change over time, including my own. So we'll see what happens with this. But I've, I've, I've tried with Volta. And if there are any mm. real Volta lovers out there, I'm sure they exist. I really genuinely want to hear from you in the comments below about what Absolutely. it is that you love about this record, mm. because I, I really, more than any other Bjork record, I think I'm really interested in hearing perspectives on this that differ from my own. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's interesting because like each song from song to song, like, like the more abrasive songs here, like Earth Intruders and stuff, they feel a bit overcooked, but then the softer songs feel a bit undercooked. And it's, you just get kind of that weird off kilter, non balance. But I guess maybe I enjoy it just because I like hearing Bjork. I, I don't know where this would rank in terms of her discography for me just because a lot of the albums after this i've only heard once so i'm i don't i can't really say uh like where it would land for me probably towards the back half but like it, you know the the weird off kilter balance kind of prevents me from absolutely loving it but yeah for right. what it is i still appreciate it you know Absolutely. Well, let's move into our favorite tracks and ratings then for Bjork's Volta. Jake, why don't you go first? All right. My three favorite tracks from the Mars Volta are I See Who You Are, The Dull Flame of Desire, and I'll say Wanderlust. I that that that's a bit of a grower for me. Least favorite is yeah, it's definitely hope. Least lyrically compelling, least sonically compelling for me. Give the album a, a light, but still nonetheless enthusiastic seven. I, I there there is maybe more worth here than you've been led to believe in the past if you haven't revisited this recently. So my three favorites would be the Dull Flame of Desire, um, Innocence and earth intruders my least favorite is probably probably vertebrae by vertebrae just because i'm not big on that like horn sample even though i do think the song has kind of a cool brooding atmosphere to it but regardless i'll do the same as jake and say that this is a light but still enthusiastic seven all right, my three favorite tricks are Dull Flame of Desire, Declare Independence, and Earth Intruders, um, comfortably. Least favorite is Hope, and I'm going to give Volta a 4.5, which means that we have an average overall for Bjork's Volta of 6.2. Again, let us know at home what you think of this record, where it ranks in Bjork's discography for you. If you feel that there's aspects of it that we didn't touch on that you want to shout out, please let us know in the comments below. We always look forward to hearing from you. A special shout out again to Storage Heater. But also, if you've been watching this series and you haven't left us a comment yet, there's never a better time to start than right now. So head on down there and let us know what you think. Uh, we'll be back again in two weeks to talk about biophilia as well, which I'm very much looking forward to. And yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel if you have not already. In the description to this video, you can check out a playlist of all the episodes in our Bjork Retrospective series. And um, if you want to go above and beyond and support us some more to help us to be able to keep doing this, you can hit the join button on our channel page. And for just $1 a month, you can support us directly, become one of our besties, get to have your name featured in the title crawl of every video on this channel. Uh, as well as I think YouTube have done a thing now where they let you see your channel members 
uh, let you see channel members on the actual channel page now. Um, so that's pretty cool too. So, so some cool perks to that. Um, depending on how many channel members we get as well, we're open to adding more perks too. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. something that's still there. Uh, please consider that if you haven't already. And yeah, until next time, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Ajax, stronger than dirt. <laughs>